Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff McNichols, Director of the Alliance for Congress. I'm excited to welcome you to our event today, Serving the People, Improving Congressional Capacity, which will feature champions from across the institution who are making great strides to help the institution work more effectively. The Alliance for Congress is a new initiative with a mission to help Congress invest in its own capacity to tackle big issues and serve the public good. Our vision is for a Congress that can earn public trust by more effectively listening, leading, and legislating for our entire diverse nation. Today's event is a unique opportunity to hear from those committed to building a more effective institution where members and staff can work together and deliver results to benefit all people. I'm pleased to welcome former Congressman Tom Graves, former Vice Chair of the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress and Legislative Branch Appropriator to kick off our event with opening remarks. Before joining Congress, Tom was a small business owner, a real estate investor, and a Georgia State Representative. In Congress, as a senior member of the House Appropriations Committee, Tom had a unique understanding of the complexities of government funding. And in his leadership role on the Modernization Committee, he pushed the envelope and disrupted the status quo to get Congress working better for all Americans. Given his wealth of experience, I can think of no one better to help kick off our conversations today. Congressman Graves, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jeff, and it's great to be with everyone, and, and I'm very grateful for what you're doing. You're, you're continuing on with the efforts that, uh, that I was able to be a part of in my days in Congress, but also um, uh, what the, con the continuation of what the Modernization Committee and so many others are, are working towards today. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Arizona State University for allowing me to um, use our facilities today as I'm presenting remotely. Um, but uh, I'm really excited to be able to join uh, with uh, you know, a good friend of mine, Representative Mark Amaday, and, and certainly uh, uh, Tim Monahan and others who are part of this uh, discussion. But I, I got to tell you, one of the most exciting and probably the capstone of my 20 years of public service was serving as the vice chair on the modernization committee, because I think everyone knows that there is more that the legislative branch can do that the processes and the, uh, the workflows, the, the uh, everything's sort of been broken and obviously there's been a lack of civility there's a lack of trust. And, and thus, you end up with government shutdowns. You end up with a lot of things that you know are, are cliffs and and, uh, and 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 various uh, nomenclatures out there that that disrupt the economy, that disrupt the American people, that just dis disrupt the ways of life. And so, to be able to finish out my legislative career as one who, quite frankly, was elected to be a disruptor, to finish my my legislative my public service career as one who was. Uh, a task with the effort of trying to make it work again in an environment where things just quite frankly weren't working. And uh, to know that you've assembled a panel and a discussion today that continues that effort, because I, I have to tell you, there is a true desire, uh, a desire amongst our constituencies, a desire broadly, even amongst Republicans and Democrats who are serving together currently, a desire that the process work a desire to work together again, a desire to be bipartisan. Uh, it's just unfortunate that politics sometimes forces everyone into various corners and or, or various jerseys in which they must wear or, or uh, parties in which they must represent rather than the representation of ideas and concepts and working together. So what I learned the most, and you, you mentioned it in your opening remarks there, in what we did as a modernization committee really was to focus and reflect on if there is this broad diversity of ideas, a broad diversity of, of solutions, a broad diversity of backgrounds and experiences, how do you begin meshing them back together to get the best of all of it? And, uh, and I was just proud to serve with uh, Chairman Derek Kilmer in this effort, two individuals who come from the furthest places, if you think about it, geographically and politically, he and I learning to work together along with others on a committee that was completely bipartisan. It was the most bipartisan committee in the House the last Congress. And uh, we were able to effectively pass out nearly 100 recommendations that I'm excited to say the committee has thus far seen enacted nearly two thirds of those. And, uh, and so it's a continual effort. And, uh, but what, with the purpose and the goal and the strive is how do you best serve the American people and how, how can Congress better do that? So I really, I'm grateful for uh, this conversation today. And I hope it's one that you will continue on with because at the end of the day, if the process is gonna work again, if Congress is gonna be fully functional again, 
it will have to be in a bipartisan way. There's no other way about it. It can't be one party rule at any given time. And I've experienced it when I was in the majority and I've seen it uh, since when the other party was in the majority. So uh, I'm, I'm thankful for the panel you've put together, the discussion that'll be here today and, uh, and uh, really uh, look forward to seeing the positive results in the days ahead. But thanks again for allowing me to kick off this great discussion. Thank you, Congressman Gray, for that great introduction to, to uh, our conversations today. We really appreciate it. The Committee on House Administration and the Select Committee have a unique relationship. While the Select Committee can pass recommendations, much of the implementation work resides under the jurisdiction of House Administration. We're pleased to have, have staff directors from both committees to share their success in implementation of recommendations and give us a sense of future plans. To lead this conversation, I'm glad to welcome Marcy Harris, CEO and co-founder of Popbox, a neutral nonpartisan platform that prioritizes civic engagement and public information. Over to you, Marcy. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, as you mentioned, we have today the staff leaders of the House Administration Committee and the Committee on Modernization. So basically for House modernization efforts, this is the staff version of the big four. And I'm so excited to be able to talk with them. I want to first turn to uh, Jamie Fleet, uh, the staff director of the Committee on House Administration, and Tim Monahan, the Republican staff director of the House Committee on, on Administration, and, and just ask a bit about what it's like to, to work with that committee that has such massive jurisdiction from election administration to security of the physical building of the House, uh, to the Library of Congress and the technology in the House. You've been working on these issues for a long time. And then over the past two and a half years, the Select Committee on Modernization has been making recommendations, many of which touch on the work that you've been doing. So how has that affected your work? What, it's been, what has it been like uh, to work uh, in partnership with the Select Committee? And what changes have you made as a result? Turn to you first, Jamie. Oh, I've got you. I'm sorry. I was, I was having struggling with my mute button there. I'm doing this in the car, uh, taking advantage of some of that technology that the house has been implementing and modernized over the last two and a half years. In fact, this Zoom call we think is the 58,110 ish uh, Zoom call that the house has done since taking Zoom enterprise wide during the pandemic. Um, one of the things that I think we're most proud of at House administration, and I think I can speak for, for Tim uh, in saying this, is really the bipartisan nature in which we've approached the collaboration with the, with the select committee. Uh, the select committee uh, you know, benefits from obviously the service of uh, Ms. Lofgren and Mr. Davis, which is unique in the fact that both of them are, are two congressional staffers, two former congressional staffers. So they have a very unique perspective that they bring uh, to their service at House Administration and to the Modernization Committee. And the relationship's been a good one. And I think that that tone has began with uh, Chairman Kilmer and uh, Vice Chair Graves and continues with Kilmer and Vice Chair Timmons. And we've, we've really enjoyed working together to, to uh, modernize the institution. And whether that's been uh, development of the HR hub, whether it's been making the diversity and inclusion office permanent, providing a paid transition aid for new member orientation, really reformatting new member orientation. I mean, we had the longest, most comprehensive new member orientation in the House's history, and we did it in a pandemic. And whether or not it's been the, the feedback they've given us to help us pursue legislation that allowed us to, to modernize the Franking Commission for the first time in a half century, the collaboration has been uh, extraordinarily productive, I think, for the institution on a bipartisan basis. So all in all, it's been a very productive and enjoyable uh, working relationship, and we've got a lot more work to do. Here, here. Uh, over to you, Tim, and, and really just thinking about, I mean, you guys even have a person on staff dedicated to, to modernization. How, how has this experience been for you over the past uh, several uh, years? Well, thanks for the question. And it's been really exciting. I agree with 
a lot of what Jamie had to say, but I think the biggest um, benefit of working with the MyCom committee is the fact that we have more members engaged on these internal issues. We've been able to uh, mainstream a lot of these ideas that have been around for a while, but hadn't been able to get a lot of traction. And, and Jamie hit on a few of those. Um, certainly the uh, revisions to the franking guidelines um, come top of mind. Um, but then also um, with that, uh, ModCom has been able to provide some cover for house administration to do some things that we haven't been able to do in the past. So I think it's been a really good collaboration. And, and I really feel like um, it had been building, the momentum had been building for a number of years. And with the creation of the Modernization Committee, the beginning of last Congress, um, we've been really able to put pen to paper um, on a lot of these conversations that have been ongoing. And, and Marcy, as you said, we do have uh, a full-time person that's just focused on um, modernization ideas and implementation. And, and that's a key piece of it. It's been great to have the 97 recommendations from last Congress and even more this Congress, but we have to get those things done. And so um, it's been fun to roll up our sleeves and um, work with our support entities like the CAO um, to show them that this is not just a bunch of, of ideas uh, in a report, but we're actually gonna transform the house and, and it has been bipartisan. Thank you so much. And we'll now turn to the staffers from the Select Committee on Modernization, uh, Yuri Beckelman and Derek Harley. Uh, Yuri and Derek, you picked up the baton that was passed to you from the 116th Congress to the 117th. As Tim mentioned, there were uh, uh, 97 recommendations in the previous Congress, and there and you and you've come up with another 20. The, the members have this year. What's it been like uh, in this Congress? You didn't need to set up the committee and start from zero you got to hit the hit the ground running with the previous recommendations and then move on uh to to the new recommendations what's that been like uh over to you first uh yuri oh we got to set up in the middle of a very unique and special time um where all of our partners are working you know together where we had a set of recommendations that we wanted to work off and we wanted to implement that makes sense that have clear guidance um and then also kind of a mandate to take on some things that didn't get taken on next con last Congress. So we've already issued 20. We're going to have a bunch more recommendations barreling down on you, Jamie and Tim, um, that are going to be great. Um, and it really gives us the kind of uh, runway we need to come up with some new ideas while also dedicating more staff time than I think has ever really been done before with the Modernization Committee on seeing uh, implementation through. We actually have a whole team making sure that these recommendations aren't just on paper, but are actually um, going into action. And we just have really have great partners from the very beginning, both in the business support offices and with the committees that are uh, really intent on making sure that these recommendations come into reality. Excellent. Over to you, Derek. Yeah, well, the first the First iteration really forged a path for us, um, and uh, we appreciate the good work that they did, and it's given us a springboard to work from. And in that regard, I think we're fortunate to have a couple of staff who carried over with us uh, from the last time around, too, which helps the continuity at the staff level, of course, in addition to the members who carried over from last time as well. And it's changed a little bit uh, for us, I think, um, now that, as Yuri alluded to, a big part of our mission this time around, which I don't think they had last time as much, is is working on implementation to make sure that uh, I think it was a, a commitment that the members made coming into this Congress and made clear to Yuri and me that uh, a big part of what we're going to try to do is monitor and help implement and that we don't have um, oversight authority or legislative authority. I, I say we have uh, where's the squeak wheel authority and uh, we uh, just try to cajole and and, um, and and remind and unfortunately we have great partners in the Committee on House Administration and the team over there and I, I I was up here for a long time before I came back to the Hill to join the committee, and I'm not sure there's other areas with, with a story where two committees work so closely together and have such good close interpersonal relationships at the staff level, which we really appreciate. And I think the other benefit to us, too, is because we've had that focus on implementation as well, is um, it's also forced us to look at the recommendations we make in a little bit of a different way. Right? We, uh, we see and have seen what it's like to try to implement these things and realize that it's it's more complicated than it may have first appear on a piece of paper. So it's forced us to really think things through to be thorough in terms of defining the problem, making sure that things are implementable, achievable, 
And that's where working with all our partners, the support agencies, as Yuri mentioned, but also our friends at CHA, which has made it, uh, made it a lot easier. That's fantastic. I think really notable how closely you've worked with the implementing offices uh, to plan the recommendations that you're working on. I, I like the term the squeaky wheel authority. I think that's that's a, a really good way to characterize the work of the ModCom. Uh, Jamie and Tim, jumping back over to you, as you think about uh, the road ahead and the squeaky wheel authority that ModCom has and your actual implementing and jurisdictional authority in in-house admin, where would you like to see the focus uh, in the coming year um, for, for the rest of the months of this year and into 2022? Uh, back to you, Jamie. So I think the focus should be on where it always has been, which is helping members serve their constituents. And I think whether that is advancing the, the 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 recommendation that we provide more enterprise-wide solutions so that we can reduce the burden on the mra so that we can spend more money either communicating with constituents or hiring staff to help constituents and of course i think taking on taking advantage of the the technology that the pandemic really put on overdrive for us to implement i think really is central to what we should be getting done um, uh, this Congress and the balance of this Congress. I'd also say to echo something that Congressman Graves said at the beginning, I think anything that can facilitate cooling the temperature and bipartisanship around the institution, I think is, is helpful. Obviously, we're at a very complex time in our country's history, and there's a thousand reasons for that and plenty of people to blame. But if we have an opportunity to, to help cool the temperature around working collaboratively on some of these issues, I think uh, that while intangible, uh, the benefit could really pay dividends to the productivity of the Congress for years to come. Absolutely. And it's it's been such a benefit to this, this area of focus that so much of it has remained nonpartisan over the years. Uh, Tim, what is your thought on ongoing priorities into 2022? I, I think uh, to build on some of, this, some of the successes that the pandemic has, has forced us to uh, to implement, but also just to further professionalize the House on both sides of the equation, and, and those being the member committee and leadership side, but also the support side. And so we're very proud of the progress that's been made with the Human Resource Hub and the best practices that are being made available to any office that wants to take advantage of that. Um, and we're also going to continue to improve the support processes um, within the CAO, within the clerk, within the sergeant arms, um, with an eye towards customer service and actually understanding the needs of member offices, which has been a challenge in the past. And then something Jamie mentioned that I couldn't agree more with, and that's doing more on the IT front. And I think it's a combination of more enterprise-wide solutions, but it's also thinking outside the box on how do we make it easier for folks that want to help Congress increase its capacity, bring those services and products into use and cutting through some of the red tape that currently exists um, in doing so. And, and Marcy, I know you have some firsthand experience with that, but we really think um, opening up the playing field uh, could really help out offices. Absolute music to my ears, Tim. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Uh, Yuri, uh, as you think about the year ahead, what what uh, is on your mind? Wow, this is just like the, the overwhelming topic, right? This is a committee of ideas, and we are literally going through the iterations of what we're going to be working on this coming year. So, uh, you know, we have 15 topics we're trying to address at all times, but I, I, I'd really like to talk about the ones that we have come barely down on us right now. Some really interesting stuff. You know, I think this is kind of a good example of how we work hand in glove with house admin. Uh, we're really excited to see the tech modernization that's been going through. We've always had issues both with contracting and getting enterprise wide solutions, but we've also had a problem um, creating like a community of practice where people actually use the technology that is being offered to them and they learn from each other and they start applying it to their business case scenario and the pandemic sped that up and it, jumped the house head technology wise 20 years all in one fell swoop and it's something that we should capitalize on and people are open to the idea of using more technology and the other is working on um, civility collaboration and empowerment really toning down um, the heat here and creating a place where people want to work together we see that through a couple of lenses that is 
building interpersonal relationships, um, rewarding um, you know, collaboration, and also facilitating collaboration, making it easier for people to work together. And that is not just about helping the people in the middle be more successful, but helping people um, on a, a little further out on both sides, you start wanting to work together more and find more common agreement. And we have some recommendations coming in this space that I, I, I'll tell you when we started working on at the beginning of this year, uh, I didn't know that we were gonna get anywhere. And we have recommendations coming down the pike that are really exciting, that really help, um, that are, we think are gonna help members wanna work together, that are that is going to make that a, a rewarding um, proposal to work together and, and, and looking forward to roll those out in the next few months. You have our attention. <laughs> that sounds very exciting. Uh, Derek, when you think about the road ahead, what's on your mind? Yeah, I don't have too much to add. I think it's all the above, all my colleagues said, I think, um, the first, uh, for me, it's from a staff perspective, it's focusing on implementing the uh, the, the last 20 that we passed and uh, uh, are working on and going to try to ensure that we kind of continue to carry those through. I think um, I also think that the committee is really focused on Article One, trying to get Congress some of Congress's power back. Right. I mean, so much of what we do is whether it be in the staffing and the capacity space or we had a hearing last week on oversight and bolstering our oversight capabilities, uh, the support agencies, the civility and collaboration. It's all about, yes, as Jamie mentioned earlier, it's really all about making the institution work better for the for the people that we represent and getting back some of that power that I think, unfortunately, has been devolved to the executive branch over the years. And that's a, that's a very bipartisan, I think, theme in terms of everyone wanting to address the, those issues. And then last, I just say running through the tape. I think uh, Mr. Kilmer, Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, they uh, were very grateful for the two-year uh, length of the reauthorization, so to speak, that we had this time around. And they're very interested in making sure that we take every minute that we are around to be able to do this, to work as hard as we can to get uh, the best recommendations out that we can. And of course, if uh, we are always open, so if anybody out there has ideas, we're open. The best ideas often come from the American people and from people on the outside. So please let us know. Well, actually, that's a perfect lead into my next question. We'll mix it up a little bit and go uh, modcom and then on to, to House Admin to, to respond. Uh, but Jerry, just as you mentioned, uh, your openness, uh, I, I think for many of us on the outside, the Modernization Committee has provided a door opening that, that we I just it, it's it's something like we've never seen before in listening, not just to folks on the outside who are very opinionated and want to share some thoughts, but also internally uh, your your uh, listening sessions with staff, your uh, listening ses sessions with uh, contractors. Uh, Modcom, it, because it is its focus, unlike House Admin that has so many other things going on, has just been able to uh, to to listen and to work with uh the the broader community of of uh, people thinking about congressional capacity and and modernization how um has that experience been for you what uh would be helpful going forward in you know in the in the coming year uh and and how would you suggest that continues even in a future where potentially there's a different version or a sunsetting of the modernization committee i'll start with you derek and then uh past year yeah we've enjoyed the openness and we believe it's important for the institution to be transparent and be able to receive all feedback because uh, it is uh, it is uh, the the American people's institution and we want to make sure to receive that feedback and be open as we go through our process. I think um, it's been fun for me to work with with our friends on uh, in the outside, and um, it's uh, I think it's it's been very helpful in terms of getting the message out about the work that we're trying to do. I was struck. Uh, I've told the story a couple times when I came back to uh, the Hill to join the committee after a, about a year and a half away, that um, there, uh, there was not a great awareness among the American people about the work that the committee was doing. Um, I think, uh, and, and the, the good thing for me was that uh, when they heard about it, they were really excited about it. The average Americans are excited, and the average American is excited to know that Congress is working on these issues and trying to improve and, and make the institution stronger and better. And so I think uh, from my standpoint, the more that we can work together to raise the awareness of the committee and the good work that the members are doing and the, and the road ahead, I think is really all to the good. Um, and I'd say um, the other thing that we can talk about is 
is really that Article One issue too. All these issues that we pass and talk about and staff capacity and congressional support agencies. And I think sometimes for the outside, it might seem sort of like inside baseball, but it really isn't. And we need to learn to frame these issues as, again, it's not about those issues, those people, the staff, the, the agencies per se, but at the end of the day, it's about making the institution stronger to serve people better. So the more that you can work with us to help frame those issues and help people see and understand it in that framework, I think the more helpful and the more successful we'll be. Here, here. Over to you, Yuri. So the, the institution of Congress is one that's steeped in history and culture, and that's really what makes us strong, but it also sometimes makes us unwilling to believe that we can change and adapt. Uh, and it also makes it so that outsiders offering opinions sometimes don't um, apply to the institution that we work under. And so as we are considering options for, for modernizing and improving operations here, we always think of things in three buckets, the three things that are broken, right? There it is either it's just broken, broken, it needs to be fixed. Um, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, steeped, it's, it has some like old history and culture that we need to take into consideration if we're gonna fix it. Or this thing that's broken here makes this other thing work, right? And so we have to, as we come up with solutions and ideas, um, we can both help take ideas from the outside and frame them through those lenses and turn them into something that's productive. Um, and, and that's really what the strength of what the Modernization Committee has been able to do. And we hope to continue um, translating those those good outside ideas into something that works for the institution. And we hope that we are instilling that understanding in the outside group so they can continue to make good recommendations for what we're doing. Um, and I think the last thing I would say is we need a culture that is not just this place is broken, but focused on what is the individual thing that we think we can improve and how do we improve it and create teams that um, around ideas to improve that individual item. I think we'll, we'll be stronger when we do that. Um, and I think that um, uh, whatever happens to the, the future of the Modernization Committee, there is a, a culture and a belief that modernization should be a permanent part of the institution. And so it might be different. <laughs> it might not be a select committee in a few years, or it might be a select committee. I don't really know. <laughs> It might be, uh, the Senate might take it up. I don't know that I trust them, but. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, and over to you, Jamie, because I know we lose you in, in two minutes for a thought about how the the outside groups and, and others can continue to contribute to your work uh, and any closing thoughts that you may have to share. Hey, thank you, Marcy, and Apollo. This afternoon, on oversight of the Office of Professional Workplace Space, uh, we've worked on a part of this, uh, this hearing on, and I think it's an example of um, how the institution and the Congress works best when we have a bipartisan approach to policy problem solving. We we passed a on a bipartisan basis uh, reforms of the Congressional Accountability Act, taking feedback from from congressional staff, outside the, the civil society, and others, and. Uh, we got Donald Trump to sign a piece of legislation that reformed sexual harassment laws. So I think, you know, that was an accomplishment which strengthened the institution and we're going to have an oversight hearing on it this afternoon. So I got to pay some attention to that here in a little bit. But responding to your question, um, I think what civil society and the outside groups can do is help persuade people it's that the, the American public and the taxpayer is better off when they invest in these institutions. And whether that is issues related to member pay or issues related to growing the MRA or in, in, uh, investing in supporting, you know, it, can, it has been unpopular over the years to, to, to have investments in uh, the legislative branch. And I think to the extent that civil society can continue to push hard on um, helping us, helping the American people understand why those investments are a really good bargain uh, for them uh, and their lives, I think would be very particularly helpful for us. And as for the future of the select committee, uh, I don't know what it holds, I think, but I am optimistic that an intentional conversation about how Congress works is in our future for quite some time. And that'll be because of all of you. And I think really the tone that Chairman Kilmer and Vice Chair Timmons uh, have set for have set for the committee. So much. That's a that's a hopeful note to say goodbye to you and good luck with your hearing prep. Uh, and thank you for being with us. Uh, I'll pass the mic to Tim, who I'm sure ha has some hearing prep uh, himself. Uh, just uh, for thoughts on uh, working with outside groups, how they can be helpful, and also any closing remarks that you'd like to share. 
Sure, thank you. It's been a pleasure to work with so many members of the cohort, um, not just since uh, Modernization Committee has, has come to existence, but going back a number of years. And, and an important part of this conversation is obviously uh, the funding side of it. And there's great synergy right now between the House Administration and the Modernization Committee. But I also think appropriations is on board um, under the current leadership of, of Tim Ryan. But that started um, a number of years ago under uh, Chairperson Graves and then Mr. Yoder. And so we really started to, uh, the Appropriation Committee did, get some momentum that I think has brought us to where we are today. And so I think they should get some credit and recognition for that. Um, as for the outside groups being um, helpful, um, a lot has been covered, but I completely agree with Derek that on so many of these issues, it's about framing the conversation and knowing who you're talking to. And there are ways to talk um, to particularly conservative groups about the need to make changes to Congress, just the same way there is a way to talk to more uh, progressive leaning groups. Uh, but I also think as much as outside groups can create some grassroots momentum, and that can be little things about running op-eds in local newspapers or pulling round tables together. But the more that members of Congress hear from their constituents that this stuff's important, the more we can get done. And so um, to the extent that the outside cohort and, and interested groups can help us with that, um, I think we'll all be um, happy with the results. Thank you so much for uh, bringing in the appropriations angle because you're right, this, this bipartisan support uh, for uh, modernization really has has been um, uh, has taken place in, in appropriations, House Admin and the ModCom Committee. So, so that's a really important point. And, and again, I appreciate you highlighting the bipartisan nature of that work over the years. Uh, so just as we get to the point of wrapping, I'll go back to, to Yuri and Derek for some closing thoughts. Uh, Derek, over to you. Well, just appreciate the time and appreciate uh, all the efforts from everybody uh, from the cohort uh, to everybody who's just following the issues from the outside. And uh, we appreciate the support, the, uh, the ongoing feedback. And uh, we look forward to another year and a half of running through the tape, like I said earlier, and doing the best we can with the time that we've got. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I mean, Yuri. <laughs> see, I'm, I'm starting to like uh, see you as one, one entity. Excuse me. Well, I just wanted to say thank you all. You know, this is a very unique time um, for for the institution where everyone is kind of working hand in glove. I genuinely like all of the people that I work with, and that has nothing to do with ideology. It has to do with this like this feeling that we can improve this place and 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 are working together to get there. Um, so thank you all again. Um, looking forward to new ideas coming from all over the place to help us make this better institution. Here, here. Here's to new ideas and liking the people you work with. It's been great to be with you all. We'll toss it back to you, Jeff. Thank you to our, our panelists, Jamie, Tim, Derek, and Yuri for their work together on the House Administration and Select Committees. We are, we are grateful for your continued work together and are excited to see all that is to come in the coming months. Marcy, thank you for leading this conversation and showing us the important takeaways from this work. The great work of the House administration and select committees ultimately depends on congressional funding. Our next speaker plays an integral role in this process as a member of the House Legislative Branch Appropriations Subcommittee, ensuring that Congress has the right level of resources to effectively do its job. Congressman Mark Amaday represents the second district of Nevada. Before joining Congress in 2011, Congressman Amaday served as an Army Judge Advocate General Corps officer, was elected to the Nevada Assembly and State Senate and served as the Nevada Senate's President Pro Tem. I'm pleased to welcome Congressman Mark Amaday. Congressman? Hey, Derek, thank you very much. I, uh, I, I gotta tell you, I'm out in Nevada right now, obviously, and, and uh, as I'm sitting here looking over this stuff, I'm going, why in the heck did they ask me to speak to this group? Um, and so I've been listening to you a little bit and see that you had Tom Graves, who, who I miss a lot on the deal, and then, listening to the folks on the House Admin Committee, both sides, and, and, and then the Select Committee. And, and I'm sitting there going, why are they talking to those people? The appropriations process is the only one that really matters. Everybody knows that. I mean, we don't need a special committee to do that, right? Um, but I appreciate hearing, uh, 
hearing the discussion and, and, and just a couple thoughts. Uh, I, I am fully, fully behind the mission, if you will. My word, not anybody else's in terms of the institution, the health of the institution, the effectiveness of the institution, and whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, or an independent, it's like um, I, it, it does my old heart good to hear people talking about things like oversight and, and taking, taking some of that responsibility back to where it rightfully belongs. I will just tell you that, that in, in my 10 years of, uh, of hanging out on the Hill and representing the people of, of, of my neck of the woods in Nevada, and, and all 435 people have a different approach and a different management style, which makes it a challenge and leadership comes and goes on both sides. That adds to your challenge of continuity and at least in terms of for the foundation of the institution, making it strong and moving it in the same direction. But, but I mean, we do three things. We do constituent services, we do oversight, and we do legislation. And so I, I am very heartened to hear that, that, that some people share my view of there's not a heck of a lot of oversight going on now. It was interesting that one of your previous speakers had to go, had to go get ready for an oversight meeting where we're overseeing ourselves, which is fine. But it's like, how about executive branch stuff? And I'm not talking about it's a Democratic administration, it's a Republican administration. Oversight, it, it, at least in the circles that I've traveled in, seems to have been, I'm not going to say it's a lost art, but it's at least a threatened, endangered species. And, and getting back to that, I think, is, is something that, that strengthens the institution and also tends to focus things on what the real issues are. So um, just a little quick thing. I actually, um, it's not a secret to anybody that's, that's been on staff for a while. W when you get to appropriations, it's like, well, what committees would you like to be on? And, and quite frankly, uh, ledge branch isn't one that's on the top of anybody's list. But being a little bit odd, uh, um, speaking only for myself, it was like, I'm kind of interested in the institution, everything from the yard work to how do we basically fund, you know, whether it's the library, the, the Capitol Police, uh, the printer, you name it, all of that sort of stuff. And, and so it's been, I've only, since being there, there's only one Congress that I haven't been on it. Um, and I asked to get back on it uh, and, and was, and, and was placed back on it. And so I'm, I'm just, uh, I can tell you that, that I think there is, and I'm not disparaging any of my predecessors over the last few decades or whatever, but I think there's great work to be done in the areas that you folks are talking about in terms of providing maximum value for your taxpayer dollar. Um, reminding people that it's not all just about, uh, you know, depending on what, what your bent is, it's not all just about sound bites and talking points and TV or the internet. It's about, you know, it's getting down there and actually doing the job of making sure that the policy is the strongest possible that we can agree on, because usually that produces something pretty good instead of all one way or the other. And that, by the way, we have the technology and we have the training and the procedures so that it's not, you know, the ship's not heading north one minute, south the next, or sometimes we're spinning circles in the east. So uh, it's been an educational thing for me just to listen uh, to the lead in on this stuff. And, uh, and hopefully I'll be around for a little while longer to uh, basically help you folks cross those uh, finish lines and get to those spots you want. Thanks for uh, thanks for your kind invitation and and uh, if you need anything from the bottom of the totem pole, we're a resource for you. Thank you, Congressman Amaday, and particularly for emphasizing the importance of oversight and the critical role of the Appropriations Committee in ensuring that Congress has the resources to fulfill its constitutional Article One responsibilities. Recommendations passed by Congress over the past few years have implemented many core programs to help members offices, their staff, and support personnel, including the newly launched HR Hub to assist congressional offices in bringing the next generation of, of diverse talent onto their team. By focusing on diversity and inclusion, the Office of the Chief Administrative Officer is creating new opportunities for those who serve within the institution and helping ensure that Congress can meet the challenges and needs that impact our diverse nation. I'm pleased to welcome Lisa Sherman, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer. Lisa began her congressional career as a 15-year-old 
House intern and now has over 25 years of campaign and legislative experience and a deep commitment to Congress as an institution. Before joining the CAO's office, Lisa served as former Congresswoman Susan Davis's chief of staff. Her commitment to improving congressional work environments and supporting staff is evident to all who meet her. I'll now turn it over to Lisa Sherman. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to everybody for all the work that you're doing to help government serve the public good. I think you heard from an impressive lineup earlier. You did get the big four, as you said, as well as key members. And hopefully you've seen how ledge branch leaders are really coming together right now. I think despite the unprecedented challenges the House has faced lately, it's an exciting time for progress and modernization here at the House. Chief Administrative Officer, affectionately known as the CAO, is right in the middle of all the forward motion. Um, it's us to, uh, up to us to implement all the committee's many, many, many recommendations. For those who don't know about the CAO, uh, it's made up of about 700 people and it's an organization as well as a person. It's led by my boss, our new CAO, Catherine Spinder. Uh, Catherine is a dynamic um, leader and executive coming from the tech and corporate worlds, which is, which is exactly what we need in the house right now. Um, she's very well respected by about everybody and she's also our first woman CAO and the former leader uh, of HIR, House Information Resources. Two of Catherine's top goals are to align the CAO to member needs and to modernize the CAO. Before coming here, as Jeff said, I was a staffer. I did start as an intern. I've done all the jobs. I was 20 years as a chief of staff. And coming from a member office, I really wasn't sure what to expect at the CAO. What I was surprised to learn is I think it's really a model for good government. Um, bipartisanship, civility, collaboration are just part of the culture in the water here. Um, the CAO is high morale and low profile is how I would describe it. It just kind of quietly works to make the house run better. Um, you may not hear much about us and all of our websites are behind the VPN because we also do cybersecurity. But I do want all of you to know that we are open to your feedback and to working with you and to all of your ideas. So as we look at the house, we have to remember um, administratively, it's a very unique place. We have 441 parallel member and delegate offices who are divided into two parties and then they all run independently, but similarly, right? They all do the same things that no one else does anywhere else. And they do it under tremendous stress, often with inexperienced staff who are expected to make informed decisions that determine the future of the country. And of course you have to change everything all the time with everything that happens in every news, every new uh, news cycle. So the best way as the CAO, I think that we can help um, is to help offices share best practices and to maintain some institutional continuity. And we're doing this in a few areas that I know you're interested in. And if people wanna talk about these more later, just send me a note. Um, but HR Hub, as a lot of people have mentioned, CAO has a tremendous HR department and our chief, John Salamone, has worked hard to follow the ModCom recommendations to set up an internal website, which we call the HR Hub, um, that really houses all the best practices from a real HR department so that member offices can tailor those for their uses. He's added over 77 resources, it keeps growing, uh, and I think staff are really excited about this. This is just in its earliest phases. Uh, we've also done a whole lot in training, which I know is a priority for all of you too. Um, clearly the country runs better if the people running the government know how to do their jobs. Um, we recently started an entirely new training program within the Staff Academy, it's called CAO Coach. Um, the goal is to help, help meet staff really where they are by providing dynamic, relevant, efficient, and connective training. Um, because we knew staff wanted to learn from each other, from people who've been in their shoes, we kind of created a bipartisan Noah's Ark style office in the Longworth basement that is eventually gonna have two chiefs, two LDs, two comms directors, uh, one from each party whose entire job is to teach and mentor on the practical skills and real challenges that staff face. We have already hired uh, our two chiefs and our two di district directors. We've been going for about three months now with just a tremendous interest the coaches do one-on-one -on -one coaching. They also put on programs um, and they're building a website that's gonna have all kinds of handy resources for staff by position. The kinds of things people share informally we're actually gonna put together for people. Um, they do live time polls. Everybody wants to know what everyone in the other offices is doing. We're able to give them that. They have a podcast. Uh, they teach everything from 101 level basic classes to new staff orientation to hot topics. Uh, we recently were able to put on three sessions on um, the emotional issues that came from Afghanistan related casework as we saw that caseworkers were having issues with this. We got over 150 people in each of the three classes. So we're able to just be very current and very basic and that's sort of what we're seeing that staff need. Um, we're also seeing a lot of bipartisanship. That's something that really surprised me. I did not know that that would happen. Um, we'll have, you know, we've had our Republican uh, chief coach has done two Democratic retreats. We've had Republican chiefs of staff come down and show their budgets to our Democratic coaches. I've just never really seen that happen before. So we're very hopeful 
in the HR space, in the training space, that there's a lot we can do. At the CAO, we're not really out there to tell people what's right and wrong. We're just going to give them information and give them a lot of support. We are also working on member training. I know that's something of a lot of interest to people. Uh, I can't, can't reveal what we're about to do in that soon, but there will be a new executive leadership training uh, program that we will unveil soon. And I know we're short on time, so I just want to say thank you to everybody. And uh, we look forward to working with you. And if you have any questions about anything CAO related, please reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for your work within the CAO's office and for leading house modernization efforts. Your work and the work of others in CAO will help ensure that the institution can learn, legislate, and lead in the face of many challenges that impact our country. This is a great segue into our second panel discussion on meeting institutional challenges. We have heard from the House Administration Committee, Select Committee, and the CAO's office about strides made in modernizing and improving the institution's capacity. Let's now shift gears to discuss with the leaders of key house organizations how new resources are being utilized. The House Office of Diversity and Inclusion was established in the 116th Congress to improve diversity among the chamber's workforce. The Modernization Staff Association is a group that focuses on internal reform issues that primarily impact junior staff. I'm pleased to welcome Alexia Jordan Network and a Nash and a Neck and a Next Generation National Security Fellow at the Center for a New American Security to lead this conversation. Alexia, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. McNichols. Um, so thank you for everyone leading us in a great discussion thus far. As he mentioned, I'm going to go ahead and segment into this panel topic, which is about meeting institutional challenges. Um, as you said, my name is Alexia Jordan. Um, I've actually recently changed roles. I'm a self consultant with Just One Solutions. Um, and our panel has a really simple thesis, very simple. Congress needs to invest in its capacity. And we're gonna talk about our panelists' perspective as staffers and some of the institutional challenges Congress has and ways to discuss how Congress can be better. Um, so to get into it, I have the privilege of talking with some eloquent and highly reputable individuals. Uh, today, I have joining me two members of the House Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Acting Director Christopher Lange and Deputy Director Javen Castro. I also have with me Ananda Batia, who is the president of the Modernization Staff Association and a legislative assistant on the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Thank you guys for joining me. Um, so we have about 25 minutes for this panel, and I'd like to get started with Ananda. Um, so from my perspective, and I'm sure this is you know, the opinion of everyone on this call, uh, one of the more fun things about being in this space is that we can actually see Congress working and doing things. The Select Modernization Committee has made and accepted outstanding recommendations to improve the environment for staffers, and they do it with open ears. They usually do it swiftly. It's just a really great committee to watch. Um, so thinking about your work with the association and on the actual committee, what has benefited your membership the most in general? Uh, specifically, how has the HR Hub been useful? Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. And yeah, I've been really thrilled to see some of the recommendations that we passed last Congress actually be implemented and really make a difference uh, in the lives of staffers. As Jeff mentioned, our staff association focuses on junior staffers and institutional issues that affect them. So one of our original recommendations was uh, to allow for the use of electronic signatures, which was also a committee recommendation uh, that was implemented recently. So the Quill platform is a really easy one to point to as something that will directly impact staffers and interns. I'm really thrilled that there are junior staffers who are starting now who will never have to send their interns around to physically get signatures for hundreds of different members, <laughs> which is just, you know, a big waste of time for the interns, for the staff assistants, for the members themselves um, and their team. So that's really exciting and just a very tangible day-to-day -day change that has been uh, made pretty recently. The HR Hub as well, absolutely. I think that's made a big difference for staffers. Uh, I actually used it myself on the committee. We're hiring a new clerk and we posted a position recently and used the HR Hub for both finding the position description and um, 
you know, how to craft that summary. And then for the writing tests that we used for applicants, they have examples on there that are really thorough and well put together. So that's been really useful. And it incorporates another modernization committee recommendation as well that I think is really helpful for not just staff, but for people who are trying to get onto the Hill, which is one of those institutional barriers, right? If you haven't worked on the Hill, you don't know someone on the Hill, what do these jobs even mean? And uh, what are the general salary ranges? One of the suggestions that was incorporated is including a pay range on position descriptions and the HR hub includes examples for every staff position. I actually found examples of when I was first getting onto the Hill emails with my mom saying, uh, you know, I got an interview for this position, but I tried Googling it. I have no idea what it even is or, or how much I might make or what is appropriate to ask for. And so having that included in job descriptions really helps staffers who are interns or, you know, general public members who might not otherwise know how to get onto the Hill, um, figure out how to do so. Mm. Amen. I'm not sure if you guys, there was a lot of head nodding and like silent claps that was happening on my end. Um, I do remember the days of people having to run around and get signatures. And I was like, this is, this is insanity. <laughs> We've evolved. Um, so quickly, I'd like to introduce our fourth panelist, Jonathan Day, who is the chief of staff uh, for Rep. Joe Wilson and the co-chair um, of the House uh, Chief of Staff Association. We just want to give you a quick welcome, sir. Um, so my next question is for Christopher. Um, uh, as Mr. McNichols mentioned, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion was formally established in the 116th. Um, so as acting director, I'd like to ask you two questions. What do you think the strength of this office is? Like, what is, you know, what is the purpose? And how is the office meeting the needs to increase diversity uh, of interns and staff in Congress? Thank you for that question, Alexia. And it's an honor to sit on this panel with everyone here, especially my Deputy Director, uh, Javen Castro. Uh, to answer that question, what is the strength of our office? I, I, I will answer that in twofold. The strength of our office is the connections that we make with our chiefs of staff, our staff directors, hiring managers, whether that be a member office, a committee or leadership office, or even a house officer office, as you heard from Lisa Sherman, part of the CAO. And so our connections and ability to build that trust to say, listen, no longer is there any excuse that there aren't a pool of talented, ready to go, diverse candidates available to both parties. We serve in a bipartisan office and Javen and I are always very proud um, to tout that uh, as we have our connections directly under the CHA with both Jamie and Tim. And so the strength of our office is our connections to be able to inform um, to grow our own development and awareness by producing surveys and studies. So we did a compensation and, and uh, diversity study in 2019, and we have carried that over into 2021. And so those results will come out here in the next couple of weeks. We've also done barrier analysis where we're going and we're surveying staffers to see what is the current climate up here on the Hill? And how can we make sure that as different communities and staff associations are making these recommendations, how can they be implemented? I believe that was something that was talked about in the previous uh, panel. And so one of our strengths is we get to be the office that knows enough to do enough, right? And so we have the, we have the capacity to ensure that we are providing easier, transferable ways to make sure that we're getting diverse talents in these spaces to ensure that Congress truly reflects the diversity of the nation. And the second part of that is we're also open to the nation. We started in the pandemic, and so our office knows how to work fully remotely. And what that did, Alexia, is it allowed us to break down barriers where you had to be in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area in order to understand how to work for Congress. Instead, thanks to the advancement of technology and the ability of different house entities to allow us to reach um, anyone all the way from the states of California, Oregon, Iowa, it doesn't matter. You can meet with our office and we get to be the person you need to know in DC in order to understand how to operate in the halls of Congress, specifically in the House of Representatives. And so that is the strength, our connections, our expertise and our ability to connect folks who want talent and folks who are the talent to ensure that we are meeting our mission and goal to diversify Congress to reflect the nation. And I think the second part of your question is how is the office meeting the needs to increase those numbers? We're helping people get placed. I won't take long on, on, the, on the response on this one. We're simply excited to let everyone know that 
members have absolutely not only interviewed our candidates, but they've hired our candidates. We continue to do uh, produce programming that targets both hiring managers, current staffers, former staffers, and folks who've never touched the hill. We don't want to leave anyone out in terms of the ability to receive resources and to ensure that how do we build the bench, Alexia? It's not enough to say we hired a couple of people of diverse backgrounds, and so those diverse people will do the work moving forward. No, how are we stacking the bench and ensuring that we have a pipeline of diverse candidates to offer to hiring managers um, and also how to de develop and retain current diverse talent on the Hill? And so that is the success of our office. We're very proud of that. And I thank you for those two questions. Oh my gosh, what a great answer. Um, that is so exciting to hear. Um, I literally had the same kind of commentary about diversifying congressional, uh, congressional staff a couple of months ago and reaching people in Oregon, Wyoming, um, reaching people that want to work for both sides of the aisle, diverse candidates. That is such a big deal. So God bless y'all. That's so exciting to hear. Um, so Jabin, I, I kind of want to merge these two things. So we understand how cool HR Hub is. We understand how cool the work of ODI is. So you can you help the public understand how the role of ODI has changed now that we have more useful solutions for us to get this work done? Well, first, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, and, you know, there, there's I think the theme that you'll hear, you know, on the previous panel and this panel um, is us all working together, okay? So there's not necessarily a change for the work that, you know, Chris just described uh, between, <coughs> between us and um, this new hub. We actually are all working together. Uh, our office is actually part of this uh, focus group, this part, this task force on diverse and talented um, workforce that CAO has put together with our office, with CHA, uh, Committee on Select uh, Modernization, and others uh, that have come together and are tackling these questions, these goals that we want to make sure that we are able to accomplish together. Uh, so there's not really a change to the work that we're doing, the work that Chris just mentioned. Um, it's more of a collaboration and working all together to make sure that we're on the right path to meeting the goals that we're setting for ourselves here in the house. Well, first of all, I love to hear that. You're like, we were already doing it. We're fine. Now we just have a little extra tech. I love to hear it. I love to hear it. Um, so I'd like to shake, shift gears a little bit um, into the pragmatic aspect of all of this. And I'll go ahead and shift over to Jonathan for this question. Um, so from a staff perspective, um, obviously you've been in this space for a while, you're a senior staffer. What tools or resources um, would be beneficial um, to assist office, offices in creating a people-centered, a more people-centered environment um, and a culture across Congress that accepts all of this magnificent talent that we're getting in from ODI? Or if there are things that you already think are working well, what are those? Yeah, I mean, well, thank you for, for having me and thanks for your passion for this. It's enjoyable to see somebody lead a panel that's very excited and, 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 and knows the discussion is engaged in it. So thank you um, for that. No, a lot. I mean, one of the reasons why Mitchell Rivard and I, who's um, Congressman Kelly, chief of staff, why we ran for this position was, you know, we'd always all, all work together a lot of things in a bipartisan manager, man and, 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 um, and as a manager, but a lot of people in the media and stuff like that don't say, oh, great job. These people work together in this legislation. That doesn't sell saying that people work together and actually know each other and respect each other. So um, he and I are, are very good friends. And during COVID as a staffer, um, it was really tough times trying to figure out how to get people help. I mean, businesses, you know, veterans needed stuff, people get in contact with their, their parents that were in hospitals, you know, kids, people trying to pay their mortgages, losing jobs. It was a really tough time. So we kind of started a bipartisan email list of, hey, SBA, veterans, this, how, you know, how are we all working together? So things have already been working in a, in a manner like this. And that's why we decided to run to be co-chairs, the chief of staff for so it's like, how do we keep this momentum going of everybody really working together and really trying to make Congress a better place to try and improve how we help our constituents serve our bosses and how we as managers help our staff grow personally and professionally 
while doing a good job and helping people. So I think one of the big things that a lot of people already hit on is trying to educate chiefs of staff and staff about what is available out there. I mean, like for me, I worked 56 days in a row right when it stopped, right when the pandemic started. I was working 18, 20, 22 hours. I was only sleeping a couple hours a night just because there was so much to do to help people. And I think one of the one of the things that were lost in the fact that people aren't getting together in their offices because people are being safe and are trying to do their best job is just learning and educating from all the different avenues that are out there for people to know that these things are, hey, this is what is here. This is what can be used for folks and educating the different staff from the top to the bottom about all the different great things that are out there. Uh, I think for somehow figuring out how to get it out to the staff um, more, I don't know, they've already been, they've been sending the emails and things like that. So I don't know how in this COVID world right now, we're able to do that in a safe manner, but educating everybody. So that's one of the questions I kind of posed to everybody too, is like, what else can we do? Because there's so many great things going on to help people and bring people together. Um, how to educate people, let them know that all these great resources are available. You know, um, so I guess, I don't know, maybe we're just a minority, but like, this does sell for me. This is why I love the modernization <laughs> committee and all of the other organizations that work to support what they are doing that helped even stand it up. Um, I don't know, this sells to me. You know, if you're going to sit here and yell at me all day, then yeah, I'm, I'm probably just not going to listen to you. Uh, so the fact that you all started this bipartisan list is magnificent. That's so great to hear. Um, the fact that you rightly mentioned there are a lot of ways to help people and people just need to figure out how to access all of those resources um it sounds like it is a great solution that hr hub might be able to kind of play a role in um, but also it speaks to some of the earlier panels about not only staff training but also elected official training um, and welcome training which is really really important and continuous development um so that sounds like we can we can throw that in the because mix. The welcome training is a big thing because when you start in a new office, it's like Niagara Falls times a million. Yeah. Trying to get everything plus, plus people are looking for a place to live, you know, parking, you know, where's your grocery store? Like there's so much that goes with, on top of hiring staff, getting your website, getting your iPhone set up, getting your, there's just so much being thrown at you mm -hmm. right away. Yeah. And, and so, and that's why it's key to figure out how, what's the best way to try and let everybody know. But also, like you said, like the new staff and at the start of every new Congress, how do we kind of educate folks and let them know all the very, all the great resources that are out there and allow the staff that are working on these, they've been through this before, either from a personal office or they just, they have, so much experience helping other offices, they can help alleviate some of that pressure. Yeah, very, very true. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I definitely remember starting, you know, my first day and it is definitely a waterfall, um, which is a really great segue for this question that I have for Ananda um, about the broader staff picture. So I used to be a staffer in the Illinois House and there is regularly a disconnect between all the resources that Jonathan is definitely trying to, you know, show that we need to get out there and with the Capitol office and in the district office, um, even though the district office has more contact with constituents on a regular basis. Um, so could you speak to us about what the committee has done, the modernization committee has done to help district staff, how we can get some of these resources to them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the recommendations that's really important for all staffers, including district staff, is that standard onboarding training. You know, one place where you get a list of every single resource that's available to you because they're just not super well known, even though there's all these wonderful resources out there available for house staffers and often for district staff as well, just aren't, you know, well publicized. Uh, I think, you know, for the committee, a lot of the issues that we've looked into, um, we've done a lot of listening sessions for different staffers, including listening sessions just for district staff in particular. And when we hear recommendations, we do our best to not only put them into um, you know, our official recommendations, but to work on them as soon as we can if we've got the capacity. So we heard that staffers wanted to feel more connected and felt like they were left out of staff associations and weren't able to join those because they're usually in-person events that you only find out about on the Hill. So we put together a virtual staff association fair recently that we're hoping to do again next Congress. 
Um, we've also heard uh, lots of issues that district staffers have with not having Wi-Fi in their district offices, um, struggles with having digital privacy release forms, everything from agencies having trouble with the signature matching on them to requiring hand signed forms when you're supposed to be able to use digital ones to different PRFs timing out or not showing up on mobile devices. So we've put up uh, together some working groups where we've been talking regularly with district staffers, learning about what those problems are, working with HIR um, and our own team on trying to figure out solutions to those problems. I'm really hoping that next year as well, when we dive more into constituent services, we can get into a lot of the other casework issues that affect district staffers in particular. Yeah, um, I remember there's already been like conversations amongst the other support groups, you know, that are, you know, cheerleaders for the modernization committee. And I'm very excited to get into that as well, um, primarily because a lot of people complain. I think someone mentioned it on the first panel that like if you're going to rate how you feel about Congress, it's, it's, it's real, real low. But if you could make the staffers happier so that they just seem like more competent and energetic individuals, um, you know, it would, it would, it would, it would, it would solve so many problems, in my opinion, I could definitely give examples about going into offices that were district offices that were less than helpful. They didn't have a single answer for me. It was like a joke, but they also seemed sad and disconnected and, you know, um, addressing both of those problems would, uh, would, would help the people in my opinion. Um, so speaking about priorities for next year, I would like to turn it over to Jabin. Um, and I would love to hear about the House Office of Diversity and Inclusion's priorities for next year. What do you guys see, um, you know, yourselves doing? And uh, if it's not already on the agenda, what do you think might be useful for the future, maybe for the next Congress? Well, uh, so we are actually just wrapping up and starting to uh, do briefings on our survey that we just did this year. It was the second survey that we did. We did the survey in July, and we're uh, actually in the middle of doing the briefings for members and chief of staff right now for the results of that briefing. Uh, sorry, that survey. Um, it was a compensation and diversity uh, survey that we just completed, uh, and those are some really exciting numbers. Um, you know, surveys are are can be kind of tedious, but we got a, about fifty three percent of the staffers in the house to participate in it. So we're really excited about those numbers. We're really excited about getting those numbers out there. Um, the brief, the, uh, the briefings will end on uh, next Monday and then those numbers will uh, become public. So we're really excited about those because that will become a really good tool to kind of think about, you know, especially as, as, I, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're doing this work with CAO, we're working, we're doing these numbers. Um, we're, we're working with, with, with everyone in the house to kind of figure out where we're going, right? To your question, what are we doing next year? And I think this, this will be a really good, useful tool to use for moving forward. Um, kind of help us to figure out, you know, the compensation part of the uh, survey was information that we got straight from uh, the house. So, you know, that information is completely correct on everyone, you know, what, what staffers are making on the Hill as, you alluded, uh, not a lot, um, but uh, that even, so we have that information from everyone who works in the house. Um, as far as the diversity, you know, like I said, 53% of the people that work here were able to get their opinion, their experience on what's happening. And, and uh, it goes all the way from intern all the way to chief of staff. Uh, so I think what next year would look like, I think we're gonna use this as a tool um, to kind of help us figure that out. Um, I think I'm excited to continue the work uh, that our office has been doing, as uh, Chris mentioned, and I just can't say it enough. Uh, we are a bipartisan office, and our work is very exciting because, you know, I completely trust and really, you know, love Chris. He's, he's a great guy to work with, uh, but that's, that's why we, 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 this office makes sense. We understand that diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging does not belong to one party. And in order for us to look at what's next, uh, uh, for us to see what are the benefits of the work that we're doing and the goals that we want to accomplish, we have to work together as a team, both sides coming to, to, to the table. And I can, you know, I can happily speak to both sides, the welcome 
that we've gotten from chief of staffs that we work for, with, whether it's the Republicans that I work with or the Democrats that Chris work with, they see the value of this office. And so I'm excited to see what next year brings and the goals that we're gonna you know, attach to the work that we're doing because we are getting a very um, happy, very celebrated welcome and to the work that we're doing. And so we're, we're getting some uh, good, F, you know, some, some really good encouraging um, words from everyone that we work with. So I'm excited to what next year has. So thanks well, for the question. No, this is, I'm, I'm very glad that you brought up that survey because um, I remember a couple of uh, uh, um, committee hearings back, there was, there was a problem about people not responding to surveys. So like, I, I'm glad to hear that. So in the last, uh, exactly two minutes that we have. I really want to hear from uh, Jonathan and Christopher because both of you all mentioned outstanding external work that you guys either want done or are doing. Um, so if you guys could wrap up and tell us how you all believe um, that partners and allies of the Hill can support your organizations. Um, I'll go ahead and start off with Christopher and then we'll end with Jonathan. Thanks Alexia for that question. Uh, our office is excited because we're open uh, to, to anyone who is interested in learning how they can be their best competitive, competitive selves when they enter the house workspace uh, per se, that we really want to expand our partnership. And so one thing that uh, Jabin has really led for our office is really our university outreach, um, where we go and we touch bases with schools to help build the junior staff pipeline um, here in the house and then also looking at their graduate and professional degree programs for folks who may come in and uh, be great fits for committee work and so uh, in, the, in the previous panel someone said you know you let us know uh, what you need and we will try to find, figure out a way uh, to make that happen where the constituents are in the districts when they tell uh, their elected officials of congress what they want and need people listen and so when we can say, oh, the, the people of the 12th district of this state or, you know, things of that nature, we not only get the initial support Jabin talked about in his previous an answer, and then all of a sudden we get action behind that as well. And so any entity that really is taking the pulse of what people need in different parts of the country, because it's different, that's the beauty of diversity. We don't all need the same things. And so we want to meet people where they're at um, and ensure that we are providing resources that help them come up here. And so we are already working with external stakeholders um, who advise on, on things and resources that in different constituencies need. And we welcome that uh, continued partnership as we move forward with new folks who may be here listening to this program and our existing partners as well. Fantastic. And Jonathan, for the last word before we wrap up on how we thanks, can- Thanks, Alexia. Yeah, I'll, get, I'll keep it brief, but you know, a lot of it is, you know, this this association has been, you know, obviously during COVID, and as, as some of the panels have mentioned, there, there wasn't really a lot of activity going on between the different, all the different staffs and staff members and chief staff. So we're trying to get this ramp back up. A lot of it too is, is kind of what one of the things Christopher pointed is like, we would like to be hearing from you all about ideas because you're seeing what's working is not working. And, you know, the most helpful thing for us as with the chief of staff association and the other staffs association here on the Hill is getting ideas from you all that have the experience. So, you know, any outreach and things that you've seen has helped would be tremendously useful to us. And that way we can bring it to all the different staffers. Like here's some, here's various ideas that other people have seen that have worked and for them, and then we take it from there. So that would be the most helpful is hearing from folks about success stories and ideas. Understood, understood. Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the panelists. Um, when I said that they are eloquent and high ranking, I meant it, go follow them on LinkedIn, all of their social medias, they are there. Um, they are great. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of today's event. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists, Christopher, Jabin, Jonathan, and Amanda for your conversation and Alexia for moderating. It was great to learn about the ways the House Office of Diversity and Inclusion is using its tools to help the institution better reflect our diverse nation. Jonathan and Nanda, given your experience in member offices, I appreciated you sharing how these resources and others we discussed before are being used each day by congressional offices. 
To close out our event, I'm pleased to introduce pre-recorded remarks from Congressman Ed Case representing Hawaii's first congressional district. I think those remarks will take us just a little bit, a few minutes past our 2.15 time, but I hope you'll stick around for those comments. Congressman Case also serves on the House Legislative Branch Appropriations Subcommittee along with Congressman Amaday. His extensive career includes service in the Hawaii State Legislature, practicing law in Honolulu, and even three years as a legislative assistant on Capitol Hill. We'll now go to remarks from Congressman Case. Good morning from Hawaii, where I sincerely hope to be as I present to you. Although as I taped this last Thursday night, I'm not at all sure. And aloha. And sincere apologies for pre-recording my remarks at the close of your session. There's nothing like speaking after an esteemed panel and trying not to repeat what was already said, or worse yet, contradict you. So please forgive me if in any of those cases and accept my remarks as, if nothing else, a complete appreciation for an endorsement of your work. I'm sure you invited me as a member since 2019 of our House Appropriations Committee's subcommittee on the legislative branch. And as I'm sure Mr. Amode has already commented, our small and relatively unknown corner of Congress is at the center of much of our collective efforts to improve the institution we love. And I'm happy to comment on our work here. But I also come to you in two other capacities. The first is as one of several members who previously served as legislative staff. And as all congressional staff throughout our history believe they know much more than the members, and I was certainly one of them, I took from that experience the belief that the perspective of those who work here year in and year out, often serving multiple members in multiple majorities, is invaluable to making for a better Congress, and I thank you for that. The second is as one who has also worked decades in the business world and has been responsible for managing the institutions I've served. From that, I took that while leaders of institutions come and go, just as do members in majorities, if the foundations of any institution are solid, it will survive and prosper over time. For perspective and foundation, I would also add adaptability. Our ability in any institution to adapt to a rapidly changing world, including our ability to challenge longstanding assumptions or practices and change where needed. Whole civilizations, the largest businesses, have risen and fallen on their ability or inability on this front. Why should the institution of Congress be any different? You have already heard at length from the Committee on House Administration, the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and the House Modernization Staff Association. I need not repeat those initiatives other than to say that each and all is invaluable in exactly their approach to inclusive and critical review, perspective, appropriate challenge to longstanding thinking, adaptability, and foundation building needed to continue a fully functioning Congress into the next generations. On my subcommittee on Ledge Branch, as we, as we know it, where we are all responsible for all of oversight, policy, and funding for the far-flung operations of Congress, Chair Ryan, Ranking Member Herrera-Butler, Herrera and my colleagues and staff on both sides of the aisle are full partners with you. In the House passed fiscal year 2022 legislative branch appro appropriations bill, for example, and most recently, we sought to increase congressional office capacity, bolster supporting agencies like the Congressional Research Service, Government Accountability Office, and Legislative Council, foster a more diverse and representative congressional workforce, and improve transparency and accessibility of what happens on Capitol Hill, Capitol Hill just for starters. We have made this progress with the help of our partners. The fiscal year 2021 legislative appropriations bill that we passed out implemented a process in the 117th Congress by which newly elected members can hire and pay a transition staff member. You can ask my chief, who was instrumental in setting up my office in the 116th Congress. This reform was desperately needed and was a recommendation from the select committee. This change has helped current freshman members hit the ground running and was made possible by the select committee and ledge branch working together. We also concerned ourselves with the physical condition of our capital complex. 
the architect of the Capitol estimates that the deferred maintenance backlog for our campus exceeds $1.8 billion. And our attempt to catch up is 37% of the total House Legislative Branch allocation for FY 2022. But even with all of this, there is still so much more to be done. Take our staff capacity. While the Speaker's decision to raise the maximum salary for staff is welcome news, especially as we look to retain experts in cybersecurity and other specialized fields, rank and file member offices with a standard member's representational allowance of 1.5 million for all of our expenses are unable to keep up. Furthermore, the staff cap of 18 full-time staff and four part-time staff has not been raised since 1975 when members of Congress represented under 500,000 constituents each. Now, of course, we represent close to 750,000 average each, and most offices are unable to fully staff while paying their staff a competitive wage. And even if the staff cap was lifted, there generally isn't the office space to house more staff. The systemic issue of inadequ inadequate funding is also felt by supporting agencies like the Library of Congress and Architect of the Capitol, as well as by other legislative branch agencies like the Congressional Budget Office and Co Government Accountability Office. We must be better at explaining why these long neglected investments in Congress are needed to improve our government so that it better works for the people. Furthermore, as we all know, the culture of Capitol Hill can be very resistant to change. Because of the tradition of members of Congress having full authority over their offices, like we're the monarchs of our own small kingdoms, mandates dictating how members should operate are unpopular. As just one example, it's still quote unquote legal for members of Congress to smoke in their offices. Is there any good reason for that anymore? In all this, I return to the Alliance's mission to strive for and achieve, quote, a Congress that earns the public trust by listening, leading, and legislating effectively for our diverse nation. To, quote, invest in our own capacity to tackle big issues and serve the public good. All of this will not happen in and of itself. In fact, the momentum of polarization and division, which would turn differences in policy and direction into attacks on our capacity and foundation, carries us away from that goal. In this difficult world, it is critical that we continue to band together around our common goals to resist and turn that tide wherever and whenever we can. Each and all of you are fellow travelers in that cause with the vast majority of members and the vast majority of Americans and of the world. Our Congress, our democracy, are worth our efforts. Mahalo. Thank you to Congressman Case for those remarks. We are grateful to have had the opportunity to hear from legislative branch appropriators, the Committee on House Administration, the Select Committee, the House Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and Congressional Staff Associations. At the end of each panel, we heard the ways that each of us and our organizations can support this critical work. I challenge each and every one of you to commit to something from today's event that you can add to your work. The time is now to make Congress more effective. We are stronger when we work together. Let's use our energy to make a difference. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us in our work to make Congress a stronger institution.